Oh, 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 oh that's right. It is starting, it. isn't it? This will be the one year I probably don't go, but... I didn't um, want to go, but then my boyfriend's working. You've got to go. I have to go be supportive. He will, he will fight off any, any COVID. I've never texted. I've never yeah, the one here is, what's it called? Um, Mongolia. Mongolia. Ma- Magnolia. Magnolia. Yeah, I've never been to this. It's, 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 ours is the best, one of the best. It's the best. Well, first of all, it's just the best because that's the only thing they do there. So everything is like, like it's got better bathrooms than like when you go to the symphony or something. I mean, it's got, everything's all, whereas when you go to a regular one, it's all the porta potties and everything's makeshift and all this is, this is everything. They're, they're real things made out of wood. It's beautiful. It's a great place to go. And he's been like, because like they did their rehearsal weekend. Talking about the Renaissance Festival. Yeah. He did it this past weekend and he was like, he was really impressed with like their whole setup and like, oh yeah. Just how involved, because I mean, he's been there as like a spectator, but like, oh, okay. they, oh. have, they have their stuff now. That makes sense, yeah, because they run tight ship. It's, it's, it's something. And uh, I, don't th- I don't know if they do anything else in that land. Is there something they do there in the spring, I wonder? I know they have like weddings and stuff there. Oh, that's like, cool. Can, so. Cool. And you know, there's a smaller Ren Fest. That's, that's pretty good, but again, it's more makeshift, and it's in uh, on the way to Austin. Where is it? Uh, Sherwood Forest Fair. That's on the way to Austin. And the, the one thing that's different about them is that, okay, when, when you go to Armand Fest, they've got that beautiful joust in that gigantic open-air stadium. But, of course, that's not really an authentic joust. An authentic joust is when they're side by side. And that's what they have at, at, the, at the Sherwood Fight. I think that people actually could use that place to compete. Um, oh, yeah. I know, like, people from Times up Oh, yeah. Oh, Scarborough Fair. Oh, Scarborough Fair, yeah. Oh, really? It's fun, though. They, they do a beautiful job. Mm-hmm. So. Are we ready? This will get us ready for your paper. And like I said, if you, if you finish tomorrow, you send it to me. I'll be tomorrow night. Uh, so you're probably working a lot. What's that? Oh, good. <laughs> okay. So just, just do your best, do your best. And, and like I said, don't worry. That's right, that's right. You have the ASC now to help you. You're both, you said you work for the ASC as well? Okay. You can also email it to writingnhb.edu and one of us will edit it. You know, this is weird. I just struck that, you know, most of you I've known before, but like, like Abigail, yeah, but, but, but I'm just thinking that, you know, like, I'm going to probably go through the next four years, like, this is you, like, with the mask, like, like, you know, like all, all of you I've seen before, so I, I kind of see you through your mask. But it's like, I'm thinking, and then Sophie, too, you're, you're new, new to me, too, Sophia. So it's like, you know, in, in my head, that's probably going to be how I think of you. It's kind of funny. So we've got to get rid of these masks. It's totally crazy. Oh my gosh. And it was weird. It was the first time I've seen Pete's face. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> it is, it's just. Wow. Well, why don't you, you know? So am I, honestly. Yes, I am. I know. What a way to begin. What a way to begin. <laughs> yeah, but then what would you what would you have done? <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. What, what, what would I mean? Like, I'm going to take a gap year and you know travel Europe. So that's, that's gonna, that would have been much worse, you know. Oh, let's try. I guess, yeah. You can never come back. Go and never return. Oh, see, go away and never come back. Go. He knows. I'm oh, sorry. I just fell into Gollum there. What did you think? Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Hungry. So we haven't seen him in a while. That's sad. Can you zoom at least so you can see each other's face? 
Oh, oh, man. Or, or we, what do they call that? FaceTime or something? You can do it on your phone. Okay, so you can see each other. You can see each other. Skype, Skype. So, let's dive in and talk about this, and let, let me see what books you have. So you? Are you looking good? So I had my copy, and then it got lost somewhere, but I have, I have the PDF of okay. the Okay, I'll, I'll just do the best. Well, that's interesting. That looks different, but it's the same one. I don't, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll try to give chapter numbers. I don't know. Oh, I'm just thinking about how to read things, or maybe we just listen and jot it down, or something like that. Um, maybe I'll try to go to, to less, um, you know, actual passage. But I want I want to at least find some passage just to kind of get you thinking about what you might want to use in your paper and stuff like that as you back your paper up. Uh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I mean, use that. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the page number and then mention. Yeah. I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> but I'm glad you all, all can read. Okay. I'm glad I found... Uh, 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 that's weird. I'm glad you all can read it. I, 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 was, I figured you could read it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> oh, they were really bad. I said, didn't, didn't I tell you about the, uh, those classes I have that are bad? And I say to them... This class almost makes me believe in reincarnation. Oh, I told you, I told you that already. Yeah, I did tell you that one. Yeah, I did. I know I didn't do anything that bad in this life to deserve this class. Anyway, there we go. So anyway, so let's let's look at these ten qualities, and we'll kind of talk it out, and we'll look at some passages. But okay, and remember, we started by saying that uh, that um, uh, um, Walton, what is the name of saying? That Walton could be a Byronic hero, but chooses not to be. And notice, too, by the way, that that not only at the beginning does he say, you know, I'm going to go to the land of mist and snow, which is actually a quote from Robin Andrew Meredith, which we'll look at on Thursday, but I will kill no albatross. But then also at the end, he's wanting his men to keep pushing deeper and deeper, you know, to the pole, but they're being crushed, and in the end, he does listen to his men and go back. He could have been, you know, like, like an Ahab or something. And, oh, no, we're not going to go back. And Ahab, by the way, is also a Byronic hero, one of the best American versions of a Byronic hero. Um, and uh, and, and uh, he does it. In other words, in the end, he's going to go back. And I don't know if you notice, like, at, at the end, when he's writing to his sister, I, I think, like, one of the later laters, he says, dearest sister. Uh, I, I think that idea being he's starting to appreciate more that human companionship and stuff that he almost cut himself off. From. So anyway, that's interesting. And you know, those of you that are looking for an interesting introduction or conclusion, Walton is kind of an interesting foil to the other two. Now, of course, uh, uh, by the way, you want to know something funny? Hollywood does weird things. Have any of you ever actually seen the original Frankenstein with Boris Karloff? Great, great movie. But what's really weird is in the movie, his name is Henry Frankenstein, and his friend's name is Victor Moritz. Okay? In this book, Victor Frankenstein, and his friend's name is Henry, but then in the movie, they call him Victor and then Moritz, which is the, the last name of the girl that gets killed. Right? So it's just weird things like that. And anyway, most of the early monster movies are not based directly on the novel, but they're based on plays that were based on the novel. Uh, same thing with Dracula. You know, when you go, Bram Stoker's Dracula was turned into a play, a stage play, and then it was turned into a movie. I, I think they did too, actually. That sounds right. That's right. There's all different ways. Yeah, how are you going to follow it? That's what's fun about watching Les Mis, because that novel is gigantic, and so every version is a little bit different because there's so much you can pull from. Uh, and was it? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, I see. It's true. It's really, it's wild stuff. It was really good. Six, six, six parts. The one that's six parts long. It was on. It was on. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, and the and the, they, it's nice because if you watch that, you get much more of uh, Fantine's story. Uh, and it's played by the lovely, uh, okay? yes, Lily Collins. Yeah, Lily Collins plays her. She's really, really good. She's really, really good. Oh, oh, well, we kind of need to actually talk to somebody who's read the whole book. 
Aren't you reading part of? Uh, I think you'll still be reading part of uh, next year. Yeah, next year, or yeah, next month. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Well, you got some Bible. So you love the whole thing. Hi, anyway, come back. Oh, you got me off. You got me off. Okay. The. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not. I love it. It was clear. That was great. Oh, wait, who said no? I'm not. It was clear. So I mean, that was. She's. Eliana's become too domesticated to be nasty. See? <laughs> anyway, sweetness and light. I love it. Man. It's great. Oh no, I shouldn't say that. No, there's. Uh, I'll show you. I'm getting another. <laughs> you can do it. When, when I was a kid, one of the things that always freaked me there was a movie called The Bible, and it was based on like Genesis one to twenty or something. But when when I, <laughs> I know it's called The Bible. This is based on that. It was it it, it, it does, it's got Adam and Eve. It's got Noah and the flood. It, it ends with um, the near sacrifice of Isaac. But but anyway, I always remember because when they were trying to show the decadence of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, I think it was. They, they they had the like the dancing girl and on, on her eyelids was tattooed eyes. So whether she opened or closed her eyes, it looked like her eyes were open. That's just like freaking me out. I still remember that from watching it as a kid. It's freaky. Don't do that. I know. Yeah, that's what I mean. But yeah, I think they were intending to do more movies, but I guess it didn't do very well. But some of it actually works. The, oh. <laughs> Uh, that's wild. That's wild, man. I'll, I'll tell you one thing, and then we've got to do Frankenstein. One, one thing I'll tell you: did, did any of you ever see the Bible, the epic miniseries? I mean, some of it was pretty good. Cool, no, 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 no. Um, it was uh, it, it was made by Roma Downey, you know, the lady that, that touched by an angel and stuff. And they did, and then, and then later on they showed just part of it, the, the Jesus part, as a movie too. But it was pretty good. It was a miniseries, but it was really funny. They they always you know found all, all the, the the gritty parts. But I'll never forget when the angels go to Sodom. Okay, uh, they had the three angels, and then they they had you know one angel was black, one was white, one was Asian. So, okay, that's kind of cool. I can accept that. And then the black and the Asian angel went into Sodom, right, to do stuff and. Just like in the in the, in the in the book, in the book, uh, they go and then like all the people are blinded, right? And and, and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, the people turn around and they start attacking again, and they start attacking the angels. And I'm not making this up. This this is my my favorite moment. The Asian angel. I'm serious now. He goes like this. He pulls out two swords and starts killing everybody like a ninja. It was hysterical. I watch it. Watching, it's great. It's like there's not enough violence in the Old Testament. You have to make up extra violence. But anyway, oh, I, I, when that happened, I did, I'm serious. Just watch. You have to watch it. You pulled it up. That was really cool. I know. I know. This is great. But that's what I said. We said it's already got plenty of violence, you know. But. Anyway, that, that that's the movie that's infamous, and nobody knows whether they meant it or not. But when they did the scene where Jesus is tempted by Satan in the wilderness, the actor that played Satan looked exactly like Obama, just like twenty years old. I'm sure. Watch it. I, nobody knows if they mean that or not. Did you hear about it? I mean, I don't know whether they meant it or not. But he, but he, he looked older. He, you know, white. He looked like he was maybe twenty. Like he could be his grandfather, his father. But it was the weirdest thing. Did they mean it? Okay. Well, yes, but not like like extreme ones, like you would think. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. They may not have meant that, you know. Was it? Oh, see, every so often, yeah, every so often they messed up on some of those. Oh, you're thinking about you're thinking about AD, the one they did afterwards. Yeah, because they they did a sequel to that called AD. Uh, because if it were, because the Bible. Well, but I mean, the, 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 the way they did the Bible, they stopped they stopped with the Gospels. They didn't go on. Yeah, but they did make that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they're both they're both the same people. And uh, but no, they weren't. I mean, like like they were. 
they, they were like do, doing the, you know, um, what do you call it, uh, inclusive uh, casting and stuff like that. So it might, that maybe they do. And in fact, uh, it was kind of cool for Samson. They got an actor who was from Nigeria. And he was pretty cool. He was pretty cool. So. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was something else. Yeah. So that's what I mean. I don't know that they meant that. I, but it was just weird because it looked like. A, I don't know. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Anyway, we must we must continue. Okay. Anyway, the more the more I do, the more I'm helping you. So anyway, the um, the. <laughs> okay. Um. So. Uh, number one, he has sought after and tasted a forbidden knowledge. Okay. Uh, can somebody tell me the famous subtitle of this novel? The modern Prometheus, right? Prometheus is the one who stole the fire. And we mentioned him before in a poem by Blake, What the Hand Dares Seize the Fire. Remember which poem that was? That was the tiger, very good. Uh, and I think I already said it, but I'll say it again, that for the romantics, Prometheus is an odd figure because he's actually a strange mixture of Satan and Christ. You think about it, right? How, how is Prometheus like Satan? Yeah, he rebelled against God, rebelled against uh, uh, Jupiter or Zeus rather than rebelling against Jehovah, right? But he rebelled against Zeus, but he's a Christ figure because what happened to him? Yeah, he saved mankind and was quite literally crucified on the rock with the evil coming and eating him every time, right? Yeah, I know. No, normally we see it very good, but you know, in, in that sense, he was a rebel against authority. Yeah. Zeus. So, but but yeah, no. And normally, especially since we're we're getting Prometheus post uh, French Revolution. Again, we're thinking of the, the ultimate revolution, the ultimate friend of man. And there, there is a play by Aeschylus called Prometheus Bound, where he actually shows Prometheus to be noble, but also a hothead. He's almost like a, a, sort of an Oedipus character, stubborn, proud, nobody can suffer like I do. And that's one of the things. And by the way, if, if you were thinking as you were reading it, do you notice how Frankenstein and the monster are constantly trying to one-up each other on who is the greater victim? I mean, I think we're more aware of it now because we live in a victim society, right? I mean, literally, the concept, no, I suffered more than I suffered more than I suffered more than you. And sometimes it's ridiculous. Like, I, I swear Frankenstein thinks he suffered more than Justine. Who got killed? No, but I suffered more because it really hurt me because I couldn't save anything. You know, sometimes it gets kind of to the point of ridiculousness, but, but it, that is part of it. I, only I can bear this. I am used to pain. Which, which one was it? Uh, was it Van, Van Helsing? Did you see Van Helsing? Yeah. yeah, you know Van Helsing, where he's, and then isn't Van Helsing the one where the Frankenstein monster is in it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I I enjoyed it. Yeah, Hugh Jackman is is, is killing him, but everybody in that in that show is is a Byronic hero if you watch that movie. Uh, and we even get to meet the Frankenstein monster. And there's one great scene where somebody says something like, "This is gonna hurt," and he says, "I am used to pain." And it's it's, it's the kind of thing of a, 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 a Byronic hero. Oh, I am in pain, but I take glory in the fact that only I can bear that pain. And they they refuse any help. They were, that's why a, an ultimate Byronic hero couldn't become a Christian because they wouldn't accept grace. <laughs> and I've got to do it myself. I've got to suffer. And they, they take pride in their suffering. Did you give this to me? That's true. I didn't think about that, but yeah. Right. I alone know how to save the world until we end up not trusting. Even if like that, yeah. Well, he's a Byronic. In, I mean, he's he's taken forbidden knowledge and in, in, in taking the Palantir, the Seeing Stone, and he's corrupted by that, but also wanting the power of the Ring. But Saruman is actually a good one, because you might have noticed later in this, I said that not every single time, but oftentimes the Byronic hero wants to help. Right? He wants to be a friend of man, and Saruman really thinks. Uh, in fact, that, notice the way he what Once everything else fails on Gandalf, he's like, "Come on, Gandalf! All these people are stupid; they can't rule themselves." Basically, is what he's saying. We are the smart ones. We're the the literati. We're the you know. And 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 remember how it says that when they were talking, all of the the ones that were listening in suddenly felt like children who were overhearing. That fits a little bit more. Good, good. And, and that, that that's that idea that they they. 
Yeah. And again, I mean, Frankenstein, what does he want to do for mankind, Frankenstein? Yeah, help us. He wants to fight the worst enemy, death. Right? She, she would be ultimately. I mean, she, she, I mean, she, she never. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, when she gets the deplorable word. And it's wonderful. She, you know, she said a lot of, uh, you know, she, she suffered a lot by trying to learn the deplorable. And actually, if you read carefully, The Magician's Nephew, uh, sorry if you don't know her name. In the, in the very beginning, we find out that Uncle Andrew tried everything to discover, and he said, that's why my hair went gray early. So there's a little bit of that idea, too, of him suffering. Uh, so yes, bo both of them are very much Byronic heroes. Uh, uh -huh. Right. And if you, you know, if, you, if you've studied, like you've heard, you know, remember there, there was a period when they didn't know how destructive LSD was to the body and the mind and stuff. And there were some, some of those early people, like Timothy Leary was a famous one, that were experimenting with mind-expanding drugs, as they called it. A lot of them actually saw themselves as sort of Byronic heroes. In other words, I'm going to risk damage to my mind because they whether they believed it or not, they said they believed that the LSD would open up their mind to other levels of reality and stuff like that. So a lot of them, and a lot of them did do real, real bad damage to themselves. Um, but they saw themselves as psychic explorers. I am going to eat the mushroom, the, 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 the worm, the body. Yeah, that's yeah, true. I mean, they're, 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 uh, they're natural. They're organic, they're natural. That's right. Remember, of course, uh, arsenic is also natural and organic. The, uh, <laughs> I know it's natural. Anyway, the uh, so so again, the, 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 the forbidden knowledge of of uh, Frankenstein, of course, is that you know I want to know the secret of life, and at least he's learned. Who who will he not reveal that secret to in, this, in the novel? Yeah, Walton. Walton wants to know it. Nothing will convince me to allow you or to tell you uh, what this is. Uh, I'll show you that passage because that, that's helpful. It's on page 35 and uh, chapter, okay. chapter 3, the beginning of the book. Chapter 3. About halfway through chapter 3 if you're looking for it. Um, he says, I see by your eagerness and the wonder and hope which your eyes express, my friend, that you expect to be informed of the secret with which I am acquainted. That cannot be. Sorry, I just lost my place. Uh, listen patiently until the end of my story, and you will easily perceive why I am reserved upon that subject. I will not lead you on unguarded and ardent as I then was to your destruction and infallible misery. Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example, how dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge and how much happier that man is who believes his native town to be the world than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. Okay, don't, again, there are some things that should not be known. Forbidden wisdom. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm always talking to people that have strange experience, and I've talked to many people that have had a life after life experience, and I always tell them, uh, you know, tell me what you saw, unless God told you not to tell it. Okay? I don't want you to tell me. Uh, for instance, I don't know, critics disagree about this, but I've always wondered if St. Paul didn't have a life after life experience. Why do you think I say that? Remember? And Paul says, I know a man that was taken up to the third heaven and he heard indescribable things that cannot be told. I wonder, because there was a time when he was stoned and left for dead. I don't know. People disagree about the dates of those things, but I've always wondered if he wasn't, because it sounds to me almost like some of the people I've met that had a life after life experience. Uh, but whatever it was, he wasn't allowed to share that wisdom. So don't, don't, don't tell him. Okay? You don't want to hear that. Now, this is not necessarily what's called obscurantism. Have you ever heard that word? Obscurantism? That's that idea that uh, we just shouldn't know. A good example of obscurity, if God meant man to fly, he would have given us wings. I mean, that's taking it to the extreme. Although, uh, what, what, uh, what person in Greek mythology in some ways becomes a Byronic hero by experimenting too much? <laughs> yeah, Dan, I got Daniel City for us. Right? He loses his son. So some would see him as a sort of Byronic hero. Uh, and he was the one that made the labyrinth and they got imprisoned in it. <laughs> right? It's really more Icarus. Yeah. So he's, he's kind of a middle there. But, the, but I will tell you that, that uh, James Joyce created something of a Byronic hero and he called him Stephen Dedalus. Have you ever heard of a portrait of the artist as a young man? Uh, he, he's a character that, you know, again, 
seeks after, and he ends up, he's not, ends up dead, but he ends up an, an outcast, basically, cut off from his family, cut off from Ireland at the end, and he, he, he calls Daedalus, his father, the great artificer, right? Uh, and, and uh, in fact, the... Uh, yeah, that, yeah that, that, is that the book that's got the that's got the epigram of uh, now it's kind of going out of my head I'm sorry but anyway I think in Portuguese the artist that, that he started experimenting that's how Ovid tells the story Ovid presents him a little bit more as somebody that overreached Right. Now, now, here, uh, in, in some, some ways, you could say that the forbidden, forbidden knowledge the monster gets is when he learns about good and evil. Right? I mean, he, he, in some, some ways, it's not, not his fault, I guess, but he still has learned, learned too much. much. It would have been and better. And in fact, he says that. that. Uh, here's another uh, helpful thing that you might want to use. It's on page 96. And it's... Uh, it's the end of chapter 5, I guess volume 2, chapter 5, when he's telling the story. So if you don't have a chapter, chap, it's page 96, but it's like, um, if you, it's the very end of chapter 5, like the fourth or fifth to last um, paragraph. And he says, I cannot describe to you the agony that these reflections inflicted upon me. I tried to dispel them, but sorrow only increased with knowledge. I told you that's from Ecclesiastes, the, the increase of knowledge brings increase of sorrow. Oh, that I had forever remained in my native wood, nor known or felt beyond the sensations of hunger, thirst, and heat. Of what a strange nature is knowledge. It clings to the mind when it has once seized on it, like a lichen on the rock. And he's talking about that sort of moss or algae that grows on a rock. It's called lichen. It just sort of clings to it, right? Um, I wish sometimes to shake off all thought and feeling, but I learned that there was but one means to overcome the sensation of pain, and that was death, a state which I feared, yet did not understand. So he said, better. Sometimes too much knowledge is a bad thing. Don't seek after forbidden knowledge. Uh, you could say that Saul does that in the Old Testament. Not Saul of Tarsus, but King Saul. And he sees yeah, the witch of Endor, remember? To call up the, the ghost of, of Samuel. That was a very foolish thing to do. Right? And, uh, but my, my guess is that she was partly a charlatan. Maybe that's why she screamed when, Saul actually, when Samuel actually showed up. Right? Showed up. And, of course, what does Samuel show up to do? To tell Saul, oh, buddy, you're about to die. Okay? Really, that was a super thing to do. You have lost your kingdom. Yeah, you lost your kingdom. That's right. It's all going to be taken away from you. Okay? That's it. Yeah, this way. <laughs> you had your chance. You know, why, why, he basically, he's almost like, why did you wake me up? I was sleeping. <laughs> it's a really weird scene in the Bible. You know? uh, why did you leave me? Let sleeping dogs lie. Uh, so, again, he, there was an original innocence of the monster, but he lost that innocence. And I, one of my favorite parts of this, of this book is reading the monster story from the beginning. It's like we're, we're watching a mind form when he's trying to explain senses and how they come and one and the other and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's just fascinating. We're seeing him grow. We're seeing him, quote, evolve. But in a way, he's also experiencing the fall. He's learning knowledge. And I, I just, to me, that, that would be just such a cool thought experiment. I'm surprised people don't do this, or maybe they do and I don't know about it, but the idea of what a person would be like if they were raised on just four books, right? And what are the books that the monster is raised on? I think it's really cool. Paradise Lost is the most important. Yeah, Plutarch's Lives. And, you know, it's, a, it's the lives of the noble Greeks and Romans, good and bad. So you get to read about uh, everybody's favorite. Uh, what's his name? Alcibiades. Thank you, got it. Alcibiades. <laughs> Right? So, so uh, lies of Plutarch, and the the other one that's less known today is something by Vol. We have to read that one of these days uh, about the rise and fall of kingdoms, right? And then the other one, did anybody recognize it? You may have heard of that book it's called "The Sorrows of Young Goethe" by Goethe, <laughs> Goethe Werther. And it's it's a famous story, very excessively romantic story. Where some of have you ever had Dr. Wilson? With her, with Dr. Wilson, because she, she talks about it a lot. Uh, and and uh, again, it's like sort of an er-romantic text. 
and in it, you know, basically he's miserable, and the girl leaves, him, and he ends up by killing himself. And believe it or not, in Europe in the late 19th century or late 18th century, there were a number of people who committed suicide in imitation of Verta. Actually, happened. That weird. Uh, and it's, it's again excessively romantic. It's like over self consciousness to the extreme. And it was one of these overnight successes. And it's one of the reasons why Goethe later became more neoclassical and moved away from that stuff. Uh, he's the one who also wrote the famous version of Faust, we talked about before. Uh, now, you, you, will, you will know the name Goethe if you like to go hear the, uh, the, the, the vocal performance majors give their uh, uh, recitals. Why, why do I say that? Preston? Yeah, what, 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 what Goethe, it seems to be like half of the German art songs are set to Goethe poems. <laughs> yeah, he just, he, he just had it, and they said it all the time. What's that? Yeah, that's the other one, Heine, that's right, another famous. Oh, it, it's, yeah, I know, it's kind of weird, it's G-O-E-T-H-E, -E. so it looks like Goethe, but it's pronounced Goethe, it's really, it's sort of like... Uh, Go Goebbels was uh, Hitler's propaganda man. It looks like Goebbels, but it's pronounced Goebbels. That O E is like an er sound. I don't know how. But, uh, yeah, but but here to, yeah, it looks like Goethe. Is what it looks like. Yeah. So, yeah, it looks like an odd one. That's why when I, I was lecturing for the honors college, when my daughter was in it, and I said, "Does anybody know how to pronounce this name?" And she said, "Gert." I'm like, "How did you know that?" And then I said, "Of course, you, you sing songs. He's a local performance major." Uh, and uh, yeah, those poems are really neat. Some of them are scary and eerie. Well, most German things are just kind of scary and eerie. The Brothers Grimm. Your boyfriend's not a character on The Brothers Grimm, is he? I don't think so. He always wanted to see. He seems like it's a pretty straightforward guy. Oh, Incog. Yeah, that was my, my daughter's favorite. I mean, I don't know if it's one of those movies that's very interesting based on the book. That's what I heard. That's what I there is a book, I just don't know if the movie is like loosely based on the book. Yeah. yeah. Because like apparently it's like characters from a book called Ink Right. So I read yeah. three books in the series, but I didn't watch the movie's okay. Well, my daughter's read both. It's been both. It's fun. Anyway, okay, so so again, a, a lot of times knowledge brings pain. Sometimes it's better to just, you know, stay on Tatooine. Okay, I mean, and ultimately, did, if I'm reading this right, what is the forbidden knowledge that finally Darth Vader steals? Well, what, 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 what he's Anakin. What, what, what does Anakin do that steps over? I mean, it seems like he kills the younglings. But if I'm understanding it right, he's trying to get the secret of, of, of life and death. Isn't that basically he wants to bring Padme back? Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean to me, it wasn't clear in the movie, but that, that's what I think they were trying to say. Ah, uh, uh, okay. He's trying to discover immortality for the sake of That's what I mean. So it's like he's, he's prompted by, uh, you know, love. And that's why I always, I never figured out, but, you know, it always seemed to me that, that, the, that the Jedi were like monks. And at first they were all male, and it seemed like they were monks, that they, they didn't. And then it was his love for her that turned him to the dark side because that emotion was then manipulated. And that's why. But I guess... Oh... Okay, I, I, oh, I guess that would make you sense. Yeah. But because the Jedi are from so many different species, there are some of them that are married. They just oh. have to work harder to have. It's like the Vulcans. In Star Wars. Oh, okay. I mean, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Is that something you have to read in the novel? Is that in the movie? Did I miss that? It's kind of, but not really. Okay. It's sort of in there, but you kind of have to like watch it 80 times. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. It's like super deep lore, but you get used to it, right? But I, I just like that because ultimately it is about, it's partly about the secret of life and death, it seems. Yeah. Now, now again, you could also say that, that Darth Vader commits a taboo crime when he kills those young ones, right? That, that sort of... Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah, then he goes wild. Okay. So that's when he's gone too wide. I think I do remember that. I think I've only seen one, two, or three once. And you can't. And so, I mean, all, all of those things. And like I said, Darth Vader is just a great example of, of a Byronic hero uh, and a really good one. Um, 
So, so again, so, so we, we again, in a sense, forbidden knowledge is a taboo. I mean, you can almost put the two together. But there are other taboos, and again, one of the taboo. Okay, did any of you ever hear of a uh, museum exhibit called Body Works? Do you see it? If you've ever seen Casino Royale, the new one, the first uh, with Daniel Craig, you'll see it in the background. But it, it came here to the, the, this museum. Uh, and basically, they found a way of taking, you know, a dead body and sort of plasticating it, basically. Like, and they put them on display if you went there. And they were all different. These were actual bodies, okay? And, and they were, uh, you know, formaldehyde or the what. And I always thought, you know, I wish that they had some kind of, you know, um, what do I want to say, a sort of societal discussion before we decided whether this was good or not, right? Now, I, I know, I mean, you know... I, that's true. I, I always, to me, that's the most amazing irony, that, that the Egyptians, of all people in human history, were the ones that most wanted their remains not to be disturbed. And because they took every precaution against it, that's why they're in a dark box in the British Museum. Until they come to life in the second movie. movie. I love that. <laughs> they get their revenge. But anyway, the, uh, you're right. It's kind of crazy. But, but no, this, this thing has traveled all over the place. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'll show you how American this is. When, when I asked one of the pre-med students, I said, do you think this is okay? And, and he said, well, it's okay. All, the, all the, the bodies had, you know, before they died, had given their consent. I said, how American? As long as it's consensual, it's okay. You know, is it okay to sleep with your sister if it's consensual? Yeah. Um, but anyway, the reason I say that is because, because, <laughs> no Arkansas joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm just used to that. Yeah, I'm used to that now. You know. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but are any of you fans of Wagner's Ring Cycle? Okay, I, I, I love I love Wagner's Ring Cycle, but but what's interesting in Lord of the Rings, I've seen the real version, right? but 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 Wagner actually changed some of the stories. Okay, in the story, um, okay, there, there's Sigmund and Sigli, right, and their brother and sister, and they get separated, and they do have an incestuous affair, right? What's that? Yeah, like, like that's right. Yeah, I would say that. But if if you really look at the old sagas, they do have a child. But later on, Siegfried has has the sorry, Sigmund has the child Siegfried. In other words, Sigmund is the father of Siegfried, but not with his sister. Although he did have a child with his sister. So what what uh, Wagner does is combine those two so that Siegfried, you know, the, the greatest German hero, also known as uh, Sigurd or Sigmund, becomes the child of the, the brother and sister. So he's added to sort of pile them on because almost everybody's a Byronic hero in, in Wagner, and just in Wagner in general, but especially in the Ring Cycle. Uh, um, amazing stuff. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So it, it just it adds to it. Oh! That's right. It's Mordred, that's right. That's right. And, 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 and that does come across. And, and, and uh, yeah, it's in the Once a Future King, and it's in, in, in other places as well where where she uh, sometimes she seduces him. Sometimes it's Morgana. Sometimes it's a different person. Oh, that's right. It's, it's coming down. But that's right. Yeah. So Mordred. That's right. Gets him. And what's the future king? Let's read that again. That, that's great. It's such a strange. It, it's so brilliant the way they turn the musical Camelot out of that. They make a lot of changes. It's still. You ever seen Camelot? Well, that's based on the Once of Future King. Well, it's based on part two, three, and four because part one was already taken by Disney with Sword and the Stone. And so, although, although he mentions it in, in Camelot, it's, it's mentioned that he turned them into animals so he could learn things. You know, wild stuff. Anyway, uh, Merlin. He doesn't age. He youthens. He ages backwards. He remembers the future. This is a cool idea. Are you a fan of Sword in the Stone, the Disney cartoon? I think what's it again? Yeah. You've also read the Book of Merlin. The Book of Merlin? I'll have to see if I can find it on which bar because they later found a fuller version of the beginning and published it. So if I can, if I can find it, do you, do you have it? Okay, if I remember, I'll try to get it because I think I have it at home. You'll read it in about, about 30 minutes.
in the <laughs> while having a conversation with Eliana, and uh, and also writing your paper. Anyway, you do know that apparently G.K. Chesterton could dictate one essay while writing another one. I've read that before. I mean, it's amazing. Wow, that's, that's really cool. That's really cool. Hey, okay, I, I, I've got got to get back here. Huh? Good. Am I feeling better? You know what? It's, it's, it's been cooler. I think I'm just feeling better. Like last night, I opened up the windows. I just love that. Of course, uh, I had to take my inhaler this morning. But, but it still felt so good opening the windows and airing out the house. And I was really good. My, my life had been. Anyway. God, I, I'm going to get through this. Okay. So uh, let, let me just show you. Okay. Why did I bring this up? Until the recent period, that was like one of the ultimate taboos, is digging up dead bodies. You just don't do that. Right? Today, you know, we, we, we've done it. And of course, it was a big taboo when people like Michelangelo and Da Vinci got a hold of dead bodies, you know, and, and uh, to do those sorts of things. But uh, again, those of you who have read Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis, he said that, you know, uh, basically he says that the closest thing to like alchemy and magic are, is not religion, but the scientists, right? That, that, that they, were, they were willing to do terrible things to get knowledge as power. And one of those was to sell your soul to the devil, right? But the other one was to cut up dead bodies, which again was a real big no-no. And, and I don't, you know, uh, but... <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, I got myself stuck watching the boys on, on Amazon. I probably shouldn't. They're always ripping people's face off and stuff. I don't know. I just somebody got me watching. Then once you get stuck in those things, it's like all right, I'll just finish it and that's it. But the uh, it's like uh, uh, it, it got worse and worse. You keep thinking it's going to not get worse. It gets worse. But anyway, the uh, anyway, very strange. Um, okay, the uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, what's that? Oh yeah, yeah. Let, 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 let me just because this is a, a really helpful page to look at. It's on page thirty-six. Okay, and that would be chapter three. It's about two thirds of the way through chapter three, uh, and uh, it starts with. Uh, he says, "No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards like a hurricane." This is. Frankenstein telling his story. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you read any of the notes, but do you know that the original, original version of this started with chapter four? It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of all my toils. That's how she would. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, that's right. But, but that would, I mean, talk about in medias res, and then she went back and wrote backwards. Uh, but in the very, it's never been published that way, but that was the original. She was going to start like that. No, what a while, just right in the middle of things. Is that? Wouldn't it be cool? Yeah, and then just try to figure out working backwards. Um, but anyway, so back to where it's, it's he's ta talking about as he's getting closer and closer to the mystery of life. Um, no one can conceive oh, like a hurricane. In the first enthusiasm of success, life and death appeared to me ideal bounds, which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. So again, he is going to break the boundaries of science. But from his point of view, he's doing it to help. I'm going to fight death. Right? Um, a new species would bless me as its creator and source. You see how that's both wonderful and a little bit arrogant at the same time? By the way, one of the things that's cool about the original 1818 edition is nowhere, anywhere in the book, because he's talk about playing God. It's the, we, we've, I mean, you see it a little bit in, in the revision, but we're kind of reading. I mean, I think it's obviously there. But it's just weird that you keep expecting him to say, uh, like, like in, the, in the famous Boris Karloff movie where he says, ah, uh, yeah, what does he say? Oh my God! And he says, uh, "It's alive! It's alive! My God!" He says, "Now I know how it feels to be a god." And in the original version, that was they, they, they've now cleaned it up. If you if you buy the DVD, but in the original, they thought that was too much. And so when he says, "Now I know how it feels to be God," they added in a lightning bolt. But you can read his lips if you're watching carefully. And then it was really funny because I was giving a presentation where I was showing it to somebody, and then I said, "Now, now watch how it's." Uh, how it's been cut out, and I didn't realize it was a new DVD where they went back digitally and erased that sound, and so you can now hear him saying, and I said, oh my gosh, and it was a revelation for me as I was showing the movie, it was really cool, I had rented it or something, but, the, uh, but it's just weird that he never says it in the book, you, you want to write that in there, and it, it, in the movies it's there, but he, I mean, he ultimately is playing God, it's just that said. Um, 
so uh, again, but it's almost like he wants to be the new God. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely, and I should deserve theirs. Pursuing these reflections, I thought that if I could bestow animation upon lifeless matter, I might, in process of time, although I now found it impossible, renew life where death had apparently devoted the body to corruption. Okay? I've taught some classes like that, too. The, um, okay, I see dead people. Okay, as he gets closer and closer, skip down, he says, a little bit down, he says, and the moon, well, let, let's just pick up right now. He said, these thoughts supported my spirits while I pursued my undertaking with unremitting ardor. My cheek had grown pale with study. Does anybody know? Well, we already said his name a couple times, Dr. Faustus. The one who sold the songs, always, you know, in, in his thing there, learning, trying, trying, growing pale, burning the midnight oil, quite literally back then, right? All that sort of stuff. Um, Sometimes in the very brink of certainty I failed, yet I still clung to the hope uh, uh, which the next day or the next hour might realize. One seek which I alone possessed was the hope to which I had dedicated myself, and the moon gazed on my midnight labors, while with a relaxed and breathless eagerness I pursued nature to her hiding places. Deeper and deeper and deeper, going down into unforbidden places. Who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil as I dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave or tortured the living animal to animate the lifeless clay? My limbs now tremble and my eyes swim with the remembrance. But then the resistless and almost frantic impulse urged me forward. I seem to have lost all soul or sensation, but for this one pursuit, it was indeed but a passing trance that only made me feel with renewed acuteness. So soon as the unnatural stimulus to receive to operate, I had returned to my old habits. I collected bones from charnel houses, the places of the dead, and disturbed with profane fingers the tremendous secrets of the human frame. In a solitary chamber, or rather cell, at the top of the house, and separated from all the other apartments by a gallery and staircase, I kept my workshop a filthy creation. My eyeballs were staring from their sockets. He doesn't mean his eyeballs, I think. It was hard to tell. Uh, uh, I, 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 I read that also, that the eyeballs that he collected were staring at him. Yeah, I, think, I, I think that's almost a double meaning there. But anyway, that's how I've always read it. Um, but again, he's disturbing the dead. You just don't, you don't do that. You don't disturb graveyards and things like that. Uh, or you end up, you know, having the movie Poltergeist that we talked about before. Yeah. It looked like you were. Oh, no, no, no. I was just laughing. Yeah, don't disturb graveyards. Leave it, leave it. But again, all of these things are taboo things, right? And why? Why is the, the body so sacred, especially in Christianity? I mean, what will happen eventually? Yeah. yeah, I mean, God made it, and we will have a resurrection body. I mean, that's why traditionally uh, Christians do not cremate. Now, people, die, I don't know, you know, like I said, don't, now don't worry. Obviously, you know, there are people who die by fire, and they're still going to have a resurrection body. So, uh, but I mean, that's a fairly recent thing. You know, it used to be kind of a big thing that you don't burn a body, you bury. It. Uh, and that, now there's all sorts of reasons. One is just cost. Uh, another is environmental. I mean, there's not an unlimited space to. Bury people, you know. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Mm, that's wild. Huh. Oh, my God. You know, there's one movie I still haven't seen called The Fountain, where apparently, like, Hugh Jackman turns into a tree or something. I've still never seen it. It's that, that guy that made, uh, that made Noah, and he made a Black Swan. You know, he's high. He's a Daniel. It's the director that does really weird things. Anyway. Yeah, that's true. And more and more these days. Right? Anyway, okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Uh, maybe we will just talk. Okay. Uh, now, what, 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 uh, now, what taboo crimes does the, the monster do? Okay, he does kill a lot of people. I mean, it, 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 the first thing he does, it's, what's it? But he kills a child, right? He, he, he turns out to be Frankenstein's younger brother, right? Uh, the first thing he does, that it was when he burns down the cottage. That, that's not quite evil yet, but he's sort of on the move to destroying innocence. But yeah, when he kills the child and then, and then frames Justine, I mean, he's just stepped over the line. But I'm, I'm, I'm amazed every time I read this how much sympathy uh, Shelley gives us for the, the monster, right? 
Uh, I mean, uh, what, what about that terrible, terrible scene when the monster saves a drowning child? And then what happens? Oh, yeah. So it's, a, I, it's just amazing. These things start feeling it. And, 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 uh, and you know, uh, basically, uh, you, you, should, you, you, ask your, you ask your father, the judge, about this. I mean, and we still see this today uh, in, in, in sort of the concept of justice, okay? And generally speaking, the people that are more to the right, more conservative, whatever, put more focus on free will. In other words, you've, you've committed a crime of your own volition, whereas the more you go to the left, they focus more on what? Crime is, is a result of sort of sociological forces, right? And I, I certainly think the truth is somewhere in the middle, okay? Uh, and you can tell the extreme version of the right would be, I don't care about the mitigating circumstances, you did this, you're going to burn, okay? Where all, we've, all we're focused on is your choice. The other extreme would be to say, no, they're not guilty because they were treated poorly or this or that. And th this is very much a, a plea. This is much more, quote, to the left, uh, of, of sociological forces. Have yeah. your father ever talked to you about that? The yeah. judge? Because yeah. that's a big that's a big I, deal. I, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. And, and I think it's also like not, not like I mean there is kind of a stereotype of the right and the left, but especially like in the south, like the right is there's more of a tendency to be like the old attorney and the old judges who have done things for a certain way. And a lot of people who are like more conservative and like more left would say that's not true. Like that's not true. Right. Whereas I mean, just kind of, we see as a society, younger people are more likely to be on the left. Right. And so there is more of a, in the left leaning, there is more of a like motivation to look at, are there other circumstances surrounding it? Um, I think with like the older generation of lawyers, there's more of a, oh, well, he did the thing we don't really care about. Okay. Why? We just want to look at, we just want to look at justice. Whereas I think there's kind of a new era of the justice system where they're like, okay, is it just that he did a bad thing? Or are there reasons surrounding it? Okay. But it's kind of, it, it's really, uh, it's, it is kind of multi-layered. It's not, I don't think it's specifically just a left or right issue. I think it's more of a traditional versus modern I think mindset. To put it. Okay. As to like whether or not you, whether or not you want to look just at the actions or whether there's certain stuff surrounding it. But even now, like it, with the legal system the way it is, it's really hard to like get like crimes of passion, like crimes of passion or like, uh, uh, innocent by reason of insanity. Right. That's a, that's still a really hard um, like uh, verdict to get. Right. Oh, interesting. That, now that interesting enough has been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Crimes of passion. So I don't know if we're moving towards a fusion or not. But that's part. See, I remember her mother was Mary Wollstonecraft. Her father was uh, William Godwin, and William Godwin had written, you know, a lot of books crying out for reform and things like that. And certainly, oh my gosh, you know, you probably know that the, you know the British prison system. They, they had the, the poor laws, and they would put you in the the poor play, and 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 you couldn't get out till you could pay it. But there was no way you could pay it if you were in there. Dickens often you know writes against that uh, and things like that. And we were talking about the little bit of Blake, uh, but. Again, there there is a cry here for some kind of mercy, for some kind of understanding, uh, and again, the, the monster tries, but then the monster just steps over overboard. Right? Uh, and it's also kind of sad, whether she means to or not. You know, if if William, when when, when he reaches out, basically, I'm going to find the child and he'll become my friend. If the ch if the child he reached out to had been a peasant, they that might have worked. But little William was very refined, and a little, you can get the point that he's a little bit of a stuck-up aristocrat. Oh, you ogre and stuff. And, you know, it, it's kind of sad, right, um, the way it's done. But like you said, there's so many uh, layers of meaning, and, and I'm, I'm always moved by that when the monster says something like, my life such as it is is dear to me. Still doesn't want to die, right, and, and tries, and has to hold his hand over Frankenstein's face, over his eyes, don't even listen to him or something like that. So... It, 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 like I said, it, it, like I said, the first time I read this novel, after having seen the movie so many times, I was just like, oh my gosh, we have a literate monster? This is just so weird. You can't bend your mind around it. And somebody that's grown up, you know, that's basically been raised on, 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 on Paradise Lost. Really, really strange, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, let me just say a, a few things about this, and I'll, I'll kind of shout out some things. Uh, so, number three, he's a lonely wandering outcast. He has power, but no companionship. And that kind of goes together with he often destroys those who he loves. His kiss or touch is deadly. And you do notice that they kill each other's mates. Right? First, Frankenstein destroys the, the, the bride of Frankenstein, right? And then the monster kills Elizabeth. And again, I, you know, I, I don't want to push this too far, but it really does become 
<laughs> that I would even say such a thing. It does become almost a little homoerotic when they're chasing each other down. And there's a, the one scene when Frankenstein sees the sled and he says, I gave a cry of ecstasy, which is really kind of weird. And the monster, the monster's a vegetarian, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and the monster's killing, you know, rabbits and leaving them. I mean, it is a weird pursuit. I mean, they become the only mates for each other by the end. They've destroyed each other's mates. And so they're, and I saw one, I think it was a made for TV movie. I saw one version of Frankenstein where they did this really cool thing. Where, where whenever something happened to the monster, like if he was shot, Frankenstein felt the pain. So they were like, somehow, somehow his experiment, he had to link himself to the monster. That was kind of cool to make him even more a doppelganger, the dark other. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I was also looking at this one, the version of, or the used book of Frankenstein I got had like a bunch of someone else's annotations. Oh, yeah. And someone, like, I was following, like, whoever this person's train of thought was, and she had, like, I'm assuming it was a she because the handwriting was nice. Oh, uh, it was but, you. Um, <laughs> I assume it was a she, but Probably. she had, like, this theory that Walton was, like, the platonic homophobic person. Like, yeah. he was the person who was, like, the platonic homophobic foil to, uh, Franken to, like, to Frankenstein. Right. And then, like, as, like, a competition against the monster. And, like, the more I kept looking at her notes, I was like, you know? I mean, it is weird. Like I said, I wouldn't know really. But, I mean, the relationships I, I are strange. I think it is. Yeah, the relationships are strange, and, and again, they, they, they're, they're the only, they, they, they both have destroyed their own possibility of companionship with others, and they end up, you, and uh, how, how does the monster die? Yeah, well, he says what he's going to do. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I don't think anyone's ever suggested he really didn't die. I mean, he kills, but what, how does he say he's going to kill himself? Did you notice on the last page? He's going to light a pyre and burn himself, okay? Is there a famous heroine in history, in literature, who dies by stabbing herself and burning herself in a pyre? That's it? Come on, come on. Come on, it's from an epic. Dido, yeah, remember? Do you remember? The idea, Dido, Dido and Aeneas, okay? She goes on top of this pyre, she, this, 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 is, a, this is a spoiler for next semester. She, 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 she makes a, pie, a pyre, she puts her marriage bed on the top, she lights the pyre on fire, and she, she, she does stab herself, and then she burns to death, right? Uh, and, 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 and again, it is a sort of expiation. Yeah, it is very melodramatic. She is pretty melodramatic. Yeah, she deserves better. Poor Dido. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, but uh, again, you, you just notice that that as, as both Frankenstein and the monster, as they are increasingly cut off from companionship, they end up going to more and more remote places. Where are they the first time they meet? Well, other than when he sees them and runs away. When's the first time the monster and Frankenstein meet? They're, yeah, well, 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 um, well, well yeah, yeah they're, they're like in the Alps, is where they're supposed to be. They, they, I mean, other than his creation, when they first meet in Volume 2, uh, they're actually on a, an inaccessible mountain up there. But it's really, I always have the image where the, where the, the monster's like running all over the place. That's it? Yeah, I know. It's kind of, it's kind of like uh, Wordsworth's Unremembered Pleasures. <laughs> anyway, the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and of course, where does the book end? In, in the North Pole, right? All inaccessible, colder and colder, more barren, there's no life there. Uh, and even then, uh, the monster says, if you make me a mate, I'll go off, what is it, Brazil or something, I'll go off in an inaccessible jungle, basically, and stay. And the, the novel is so weird. It's like, uh, and, and why does Frankenstein refuse to do it? It's almost like he's, like, obsessed with the monster sleeping with the mate. This is what I mean. There, there are weird things in this. I mean, I, I, I've got to admit that. Whatever she meant, there, there are weird things in this. But the weird thing is, it's like, I, I've, got to, I've got to destroy the bride because what if they propagate? Oh, what do you mean, what if they propagate? Make her unable to have children. What are you talking about? You're making her. Okay? I mean, yeah, I mean like you said, and I don't know if it's just he's crazy or, or deranged. I mean, to give him some credit, he keeps saying, nobody will believe me. And then at the end, when he does say it, nobody believes him. So maybe, maybe that, there's always, you know, Hitchcock says that in his movies. You always, always have to answer the question, why don't you go to the police? It's like, no, it won't do any good. You can't. You're the, you're the man on the run. You're innocent, but everything's so guilty. You can't go to the police. Let's, let's just get that off the table so we can have the movie or have the book. Um, 
like but the uh, but, but, but but again they, they keep I mean poor Frank is out wants to be friends with with, with the, 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 the the villagers you know the cottage people wants to help and he's been helping them it's like been cutting wood for them and doing all this sort of stuff and that's again that sociological thing it's like he, he does evil things because he's been treated evilly right? like at first he steals because he doesn't know any better right and then when he realizes that it's hurting the cottager so it is a it is strange I mean you know. He yeah. sat there and waited a bit. Maybe they had gotten used to him. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, if he got hit him on the head, so, like, he's like, wait, let me talk. There's a boom. It was just a thing. So, I'm in an education class. And what we're talking about is the need to teach our younger youth, especially in elementary, in empathy and respect. Oh, okay. And so, I was thinking about that as I read this book. Because technically, Frankenstein's only like a few years old. Yeah, that's true. Right, yeah. 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 And then it, it's not surprising, I guess, thinking about it from that perspective, that he turns out so horrible. Because we talked earlier with William Blink about how like abused people mm. really grow up to be a good right. stuff. It's, it's hard to argue that for Frankenstein. Like, he observes people being kind, but right. his first interactions are all purely negative. And what does he basically say? He, he wants to be Adam, but he ends up being Satan. Okay. I wanted to be Adam, but I ended up being Satan, Satan. and then that's what he's focusing in on. Right? And, uh... <laughs> anyway. Uh... Yeah, for him, it's not even so much that, like the realization of the good person, but the realization of his own otherness. Hmm. That, that, that's true. When he sees him, he finally sees himself, and and and, and, and he realizes he's he's a monster. He's cut off from the world. Nobody uh, will, will 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 you know love him. Will you know never have any companionship. He keeps running and running, and, and it's it's uh, it, it is like I said, it, it is in some ways it is an outcry for empathy and mercy, and and I I've heard everybody say that 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 that, that the monster represents the poor, represents women, represents I, I, I've seen all, and like I said, in a weird way, almost all of it works. That's what's interesting about this novel. I mean, you you can read all sorts of layers of meaning because it's just maybe because it touches on these strange archetypal. Aspects of life and death. It's just it's the, the origin of evil. What is the origin of evil? By bringing in paradise loss, you're bringing in everything. But you're bringing in Greek mythology by bringing in Prometheus. Uh, so you're you're uh, working on so many different levels. Uh, and and uh, I don't know. Like I said, you should see the Ken Branagh version. It's 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 it's, it's worth seeing. Um, the uh, uh, Anyway, again, they, they, they destroy what they love, they can't, right? Uh, number five, we've already sort of mentioned this because Abigail, you sort of brought it up. He's a young old man. Now, the, the ultimate example of, of uh, the Byronic hero where the young and old is, of course, the picture of Dorian Gray, right? And Dorian Gray sells his soul to the devil so that what? Good. That he will stay young while the picture ages for him, okay? But what's interesting about that novel when you read it is the picture not only ages for him, in other words, it not only bears the mark of old age, what else does it bear? Good. His sin and his conscience. In other words, you know, I'm sorry, but if you... Good. So, so, so in other words, he, he, he does these evil, taboo things, most of which aren't even told us in the novel, but he's doing all these terrible things, but he continues to look not only young, but innocent. Right? right, rather like you know through the face shield here. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 and, and the mask, you can see right through the mask. And he, wipe that face. Do, were, were any of you like that? When you had teachers say, "Wipe that look off your face, Eliana." You we weren't like that. You did, were you? My mom. My whole life. Some people just have that face. I don't know. I really don't mean it. You know. Wipe that look off your face. I think C.S. Lewis said that happened to him too. And just go, wipe that look on your face, Louis. Yeah, it's okay. I think it's okay. I think it's okay. <laughs> so, so the, the, the picture bears not only the marks of age, but the marks of his sin. He continues to look innocent while it ages. And by the way, if, you want to, if you're into this, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. That is a group of Byronic heroes. Okay? Uh, Dorian Gray is actually one of them. Dr. Jekyll is one of them. Captain Nemo is one of them. Uh, uh, and, and, and actually, there's a woman, and she's a vampire. Okay, so that's kind of the female version of this, the vamp. Yeah, Alan Quarterman, that's the one from it. And for some reason, they throw in Tom Sawyer. 
Yeah. <laughs> that was really weird. But, uh, but the, you know, the movie is not great, but it, it's still worth watching once. I mean, it, it's, it, it was not successful and the critics hated it, but it, it's worth watching once. Just Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's cool. I mean, it's got uh, Sean Connery in it and stuff. Sean Connery makes anything more Yeah, it's always good to watch. And it's interesting, too, that they, they have uh, Captain Nemo as Indian, or I think he's supposed to be half Indian and half British or something. That was interesting. Uh, uh, but yeah, oh, oh, the other one, The Invisible Man, is also in the lead. And like I said, they're, they're all Byronic heroes. <laughs> yeah, that one's weird. I, I, yeah. Yeah, that, that one's, you know, what, what did he do? Mm, what was he doing with Becky in that case? Anyway. He, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 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 Oh, it's, oh, it's called League of Extraordinary or, or, or LXG for short, right? Isn't that what it is? LXG? Yeah, LXG, it's cool. Um, well, apparently, I'm pretty sure this is true. Apparently, what's his name? Sean Connery was offered Dumbledore and was also offered uh, Gandalf and turned it down because he just said he didn't understand that stuff. And then, I, I don't know if this is true, I read it somewhere, that, that he thought, okay, well, I'm not going to make that same mistake again, and unfortunately, it turned out not to be very successful. Are you, Are you all mad at him for not being in Indiana Jones 5? I mean, 4? No. 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 Oh, he said that day. I'm waiting for 5. They said they're making 5. Indiana Jones on that walker. Anyway. I'm coming. I belong in the museum. Anyway. The, um, you belong in the museum, sir. Anyway. The, uh, he's still... He's still. <laughs> okay, so, so young old, I mean, when, when you read this, do you forget the fact that Frankenstein is 20 years old when he creates the monster? By the way, uh, um, uh, Shelley was 20 years old when she wrote it. I think Maria's 20 years old now. We can decide how we put that together. I'm re anyway, the, um, can you imagine writing this novel when you're 20? I try not to. No, 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 Maria Shelley. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and even by the end of the novel, he's like 23 or something. And Abigail, you already mentioned that the monster is a, is a child. Okay, by the end of the novel, he's three years old or something. Never long. I mean, it, it, it's but it's all mixed up. The Byronic hero. They 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 they're, they're basically they're usually young, but they're old in weariness. Okay, they they or they're like a vampire and they for, continue to look young, but they're very very old and experience too much, right? The best way to, to talk about it, and I, I found this movie, uh, I don't even think I made it, so it's kind of disgusting, but the interview with the vampire, the concept of that is that they're offering him this as a gift, right? Because, of course, it means immortality, but now you're, you're cut off from humanity, right? You, you can't go out in the sunlight. Uh, uh, now, some vampires are, you, know, you, have to, you have to sleep in a coffin with dirt in it, now, now, apparently, some, some vampires, vampires are allowed to sleep with teenage girls, girls in the coffin. That's what I've heard. But anyway, very disturbing. Anyway. Did you get rid of... Did you actually read those books, Eliana? No, I... They, for some reason, like, they've like, resurrected them. Oh, really? Like, I feel like, so this is what happened. The Twilight series got revamped this year because it was published the Edwards version. Oh, oh, oh wow. So mad about it Look, they're admitting they all know it. This is terrible. Except maybe Abigail. You heard it, yeah. The weird thing is that the author is apparently a Mormon. And I don't know if there's any Mormonism you know, ideas or. So somebody in my Bible said, he said, there is biblical proof that God does not approve of the Twilight series. And there's a verse in the Bible that says, I hate your new moons. <laughs> yeah, I hate your new moon festival. That, that was pretty clever. That was his name. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, maybe it is. Oh my gosh! Oh, it did. I didn't realize that. Okay, that's right. It's team. Oh wow, that's interesting. I don't know. If I ever watch Twilight, I'm not gonna tell anybody I watched it because I would like to keep it. Oh my God! That's how it goes. I don't know. Anyway, so but but again, this idea that that. Uh, 
you, you've grown old before your time because you've experienced things you shouldn't, right? Um, he defies to the end, right? Ultimate, and notice many times uh, Frankenstein calls the monster his adversary, which is one of the names for, for Satan, right? Uh, and, and they are, they will not serve. They basically, you know, say, in the Bible, ultimately, but in Paradise Lost, non servium I will not serve. What, say it? Sorry, yeah, that's true. I, I will, I will not. And Sauron, that's true. All, all, all of them, you know, they, they, uh, and, and uh, what else did I want to say? Um, uh, uh, again, the, the number six, that he becomes more and more like Satan, right? Uh, and and uh, but um, okay, uh, he is overly self-conscious. Thinking is a torment to him, right? Often, what they want is not so much death as oblivion or annihilation. They're just they're torment. There's like three or four times it says in the book that Frankenstein gnashed his teeth. And there's a couple of times when it says the monster gnashed his teeth. Now, where does that phrase come from? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, they will be cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. They sent them to Detroit. Right? Where there is weeping and, <laughs> and gnashing of teeth. Um, and for both of them, they're both in hell. But, but they are, they're ultimately rebels, okay? Because Frankenstein is a rebel in science, if you think about it that way, just like Dr. Jekyll is. Uh, and, and they will... They they, 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 they they want to be heroic, but in their defiance, they end up destroying themselves, right? And, and uh, you know, I, I love it how, for, for the monster, it, it finally becomes an either-or. Either I will love you and be benevolent to everybody, or I will destroy you. But it gets to a point where it's one or the other, right? Um, uh, he brings upon himself his own torment, yet he knows how to bear and suffer. Again, look for that when they keep saying, Nobody, Nobody has suffered as much as me. I said, no, I've suffered. No, I've it's one up and continually back and forth. But they almost take a what's the word? A, a masochist, right? You've heard sadist likes to inflict pain. A masochist actually gets a weird pleasure from being hurt. This is like a real together at sadomasochism, but that's a real complex or whatever. The older you get, the more proud you are. Oh, but you don't understand how much I, my experience has been totally That is true. That, that is an odd thing. I mean, we, we, we start to. Uh, uh, one, of, one, of my, one of my favorite far side cartoons is there's a uh, sailor with you know the, the peg leg, and he's talking to this guy, and he says, "Man, you think your story's amazing? Look at mine, right?" And if you look at the picture, the guy he's talking to has a peg head. I love it. And he's trying to pick this one. Okay, anyway. Oh, oh yes, you're right in Jaws, the original Jaws. That's our, and he's like, he's like looking at his what do you call that um, the scar you get when you get a hernia or, or no no appendix. I think he's looking at his appendix scar or something. Yeah, that? Oh, they, you're right. They do. How painful it was. And girls like to put them on their ankles, but I'm told that's particularly painful for your ankles. Yeah, I don't know what maybe because it's thin. The skin is thin. Yeah, and it's also like a Oh, maybe yeah, but I'm, I'm always told that that's one of the most painful. And, you know, and you, most of the girls I see seem to like that. Maybe you can hide it. Oh, that's true. I, I don't know. But the but but again, you, you notice that a lot of times they have brought their own torment upon. There's a phrase, "mine own execution." That comes from that same place. That's not from the bell tolls. It tolls me, John. John Dunn. I am my own executioner. Right. Again, we talked about that. He often aged humanity, but he's cut off. Right. He considers himself of a different order. He wants to be part of it. He wants to help it. Like I said, even the monster wants to help the cottagers. Frankenstein, but Frankenstein ends up looking down on other people. He's, he's sort of cut off from them. He's, he's, they're the common herd, and he's going to help them, but he's lost touch with the very people he says he wants to help and save. Right? Uh, one of the ones I love, he struggles with his status as fiery dust mid-bay between the angel and beast. Okay. And, and that's the best example then is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He thinks he can separate out the darker side of him, right? but we can't. And, and first of all, so many people that think they're saying Christianity say soul is good, body is bad. That's not Christianity, that's not the Bible. It's, it's called Gnosticism, it's called dualism. Uh, but so many people grew up with that. Okay? <laughs> right? um, but there, there's this idea that we want to separate out, but we are enfleshed souls. And if we try to become like an angel, we often end up becoming like a beast. And we need to 
come to grips. Now, here's a good example of somebody who can't come to grips with his own physicality. He starts by praising man by saying, what a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, right? Uh, in form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. Somebody I hope knows what I'm quoting there. That's Hamlet. Hamlet's famous speech. What a piece of work is a man. It's, it's, it's kind of like, but, does anybody know how he finishes his speech? And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? It's a good name for a novel, quintessence of dust. Probably is a novel with that name already. Uh, okay, uh, so again, they, they, they go back and forth, right? They, they, and they think about how the monster at first, he basically thinks of the cottagers as angels. And then they're sort of beasts. And he himself wants to rise up, and then he sinks down, back and forth. So, so again, uh, there, there, there's, there's so many places there. Uh, uh, again, uh, good, good places like the, the, the beginning of the monster's speech to Frankenstein, where he lays things out as a good place. Because right there from the beginning, you can tell his suffering and all. Uh, and and uh, some of the things Frankenstein says to Walton, and even what the monster says to Walton at the end. And even he's trying to convince Walton that nobody suffered as much as him. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, just, it's, it, it's kind of funny. It's, it's kind of ghoulish at the same time. Uh, but again, you're writing your paper on this. And, and I'll tell you now that I'm not going to test you, per se, on Frankenstein. The way the test is going to look, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you emails later, but basically I'm going to give you uh, five quotes, five, five passages of poetry. And, and since we're doing it online anyway, I'm going to just tell you what it is. In other words, here's a passage from Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey. And you're going to have four passages, and you're going to have to analyze, analyze the passage and talk about how it embodies key themes from the class. So that, that'll be the mid -term. But I'll tell you more. But I just want you to think ahead so you're not worried about it. Now, I, 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 will, like, I will, like, like for instance, here. If I give you a poem that's got a Byronic hero, then I'll expect you to know the stuff we're talking about in relationship to Frankenstein. But there's not going to be a question on Frankenstein, because that's what you're writing your paper on. Uh, so just kind of get to know the main themes of Frankenstein and how they're related to the poetry. That would be where it would come in your midterm. Okay, so don't worry if you're, because you know, we didn't have time to go over it. You, you, you know, you'll show me that you know Frankenstein by your paper. Sophia? Uh, for sure. Okay. But the, uh, let me just stop this here. But the, uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll tell you more.